Well, hello, I'm Russell Grossman. I'm one of the executive members at the European Cantors Association. And in this episode of Voice of the Cantor, we're looking at the first of a two-parter on the subject of who needs NUSA. Let me tell you a little bit first about the European Cantors Association. European Cantors Association is an independent organization established in the United Kingdom in 2012. It's a framework for cantors, prayer leaders and interested lay people across the spectrum of Jewish worship to engage in dialogue, training and profile raising to ensure that the beautiful and unique music of Jewish prayer continues to enhance synagogue services for future generations. ECA arranges conventions in the UK and European cities and is presenting this Zoom series, The Voice of the Cantor. The ECA's academic wing presents international conferences on the music of Jewish prayer in partnership with universities around the world. And now to our moderator this evening, Hirsch Kashtan. Hirsch is the ECA Convention Programme Director. He trained at London's Jews College and is also passionate about synagogue music, although he spent his career in business. He creates and runs the ECA's very successful convention programmes. On his retirement, Hirsch offered his time to the Jewish Music Institute, taking several responsible roles. Hirsch created and ran to Philharmonic, a precursor to the European Cantors Association. His special interest is in learning, chanting the Torah, with a focus on communicating the contents to the congregation. Hirsch now has a very busy programme, active on both international and UK charities. For ECA, Hirsch advises on all aspects of our work and creates and delivers ECA convention programmes. Hirsch, over to you. Thanks for joining this session focused on Nusach. Uh, we have hopefully four very distinguished panellists today, um, but I'm going to introduce each of the panellists in turn. And then, having introduced all of them, I'll ask each of them to say a few more words about their background and how they came to be what they are. And then we'll go on to the, the main topic. Uh, the main topic tonight, of course, being Nusach. Now, um, when we're going on to the main topic, you're very welcome to put questions into the chat. And then once we've, once we've discussed among the panelists, there'll be an opportunity for your questions to come to the panel. Try not to clutter up the chat with chat, otherwise I won't be able to see your questions. And I'm going to start by saying a bit about Rabbi, Rabbi Jeffrey Schisler. So Jeffrey was born in Brighton. From a young age, he wanted to go on the stage, but he became religious and he turned to the Bima instead. Jeffrey studied at Jews College with Reverend Leo Brill, Zichrona um, Levracha. I also did for a tiny amount. And he became a Chazan at the age of 20 in Finchley Central Shul. His first full time post was in the new synagogue Egerton Road in Stamford Hill. He was there for some years and then he was in Kenton for many years. He went to Bournemouth as Minister Chazan and gained Samicha while, while there. And then he was in the new West End as rabbi for almost 14 years, the last two of which he also served as Chazan. So Jeffrey has taught Nusach at Phila at Jews College to rabbinic students, and he spent 11 years also at Jews College teaching laymen. And he's published two volumes of original composition, compositions for Shul, Shira Lo Shir Chadash, which we have used in Cantor's conventions. Very, very good. Jeffrey, would you like to say a few words, particularly about how you decided to get involved with being a cantor? Well, I, as you just said, I always wanted to be a cousin. Uh, um, for, since, since I couldn't be a, an entertainer on the stage, I decided to become a cousin. It's as simple as that. Okay, and a rabbi? Well, when I came to Bournemouth, I, I, I went to Bournemouth as the... Um, Minister Khazan, there was no, uh, there was no rabbi there, and there was no Khazan, and they wanted me as the minister. But the fact that I'm also, I was trained as a Khazan, and I am a Khazan, uh, was um, the reason really why they appointed me. Okay, all right. So I'm going to move on to Charles. Charles has worked as music director with world's leading cantors. He tells me for over fifty years. That is amazing, amazingly impressive. Uh, he's also written, he's the author of What to Listen For in Jewish Music, um, and also a book called Shul Going, 
2,500 years of impressions and reflections on visits to the synagogue. Well, I think I'm going to I'm going to invite you to carry on by asking you to tell us a little bit about how you how you came to be um, in this in these roles. What brought you, what brought you to get involved in this way? Uh, yeah, well, my my father's Granolive Rocker was a singer, and he sang in the Shul Choir in Shackle Lane, the old Stoke Newington Synagogue. Um, <clears throat> in North London and he was a very fine singer and when I was eight years old he said to me now you're eight years old you will have to join the Shul Choir so it was men and boys under the late Lionel Land. This was a, a, a small shul in Hackney in North London, East London. The choir consisted of four men, two basses, two tenors, my father's one of them, and boy altos and boy sopranos and amongst the alumni of the choir was uh, Abe Lubin, who was later became the president of the Cantor's Assembly, and Stanley Cohen, who's very much with us, as you all know, a great chorister, and his son is a great cousin, Simon Cohen. So from a tiny little shul in, on the edges of the East End of London in Hackney, uh, this was a phenomenal uh, place to learn and uh, learn Shul music. When I was eight years old, I just was thrown into it, and I loved it from the minute. I so I, I uh, inherited a love of music from my father, and I just loved to be in it. We had a highly sophisticated. We were. I was lucky. We had a fine cousin, cousin Einhorn, uh, who had been from Vienna, but unfortunately he died while I was still a boy. And a bit later we had. Um, uh, now of course I've I've forgotten who it was, but we had. Um, uh, a lot of uh, he, he went Karen to Siegel. Siegel, cousin Siegel, exactly. Thank you for reminding me. So we and I learned a lot from them. Uh, but the time I was finished uh, uh, being a, a, a boy soprano in the Shul Choir, um, I, I learned harmony. We, we, the point is, we sang perfect repertoire. We sang the whole Blue Book. We sang beyond the Blue Book. We sang pieces by magnificent pieces by Gerovich. Nobody sings Gerovich. Nobody's even heard of Gerovich. This is like a magnificent, magnificent. Of course, Lewandowski is also no question. Absolutely, that was bread and butter. And it was this background uh, that that, I, yeah. it, that uh, encouraged me to stay, uh, to, to pursue this field. So later on, I became a teacher, music teacher, and I um, qualified, I was taught in schools, music teacher, and uh, I, various times I, I um, had the opportunity to, to fill in as a bal to filler here and there. So that was the real, really the beginning. And then um, I, uh, at some point, I, I was the, the choir director at Eggerson Road, where Rabbi Schisler was at the time as cousin. The position of choir master became vacant, and I realized if I step into this highly prestigious shul with magnificent repertoire and wonderful choir and a wonderful history and an appreciative congregation, I thought if I can get my foot in the door in this shul, um, then uh, the, uh, I, I will get somewhere. And that's exactly what happened. So, and from Egerton Road, I went to Finchley. So I was the uh, choir director with Naftali Hirschdick when he was in Finchley. And then if things were very tough. I was a high school teacher. I taught at JFS as well. Things were very tough in the 70s. It was, there was massive inflation. It was a very, very, very tough economic situation. My wife said, let's get out of here. Let's go to Canada. But you can do the same work for 10 times the salary, which is exactly what happened. As soon as I got to Canada, someone said to me, you must meet Chazan Danto. Um, and as soon as I met Chazan Danto, he... Um, he, he sat me down at the piano. He says, I, I'm going to sing something. He says, give me G Fragish. So I sit at the piano. I just sing G, G I give him a, da, 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 just a bit of G Fragish. I'm waiting for him to sing. So he looks at me and says, you got the job. Because the point was, I was the first person he'd met who actually knew what G Fragish was. And he was so impressed that I actually knew what Fragish was that yeah, I got the job. And then, so working with Chazandanto, I don't have to tell you, this is like... Um, World, world class, we're talking world class. And from then on, I got to meet people in, in the Kansas Assembly. I went to the Kansas Assembly conventions. And uh, from then on, um, then later on, I, when Cousin Danto retired, um, Aaron Bensu's son came over. So I worked with Aaron Bensu's son for 10 years. And then I retired. So I now 
I, I lived downtown Toronto. It would be like living in, in, in Whitechapel, if you think of that way. But we have a tiny little shul, which is, I see Saul Zim is with us. Uh, and Saul Zim grew up in, on, uh, from, from, uh, beside this little shul. And, uh, and um, it's still going strong after 100 years. So I sometimes take services there. And so that's my, I keep, <laughs> I keep my hand in that way. So, and uh, there you go. So I hope that answers your question. It, it does, very good. You've got a wonderful history there. Okay, um, Benji, let's, let's turn to you. Um, you, you, have, um, you were born in London, but I gather you've lived in Manchester for the last 15 years. As your day job, you're head of Kodesh Jewish Studies mm -hmm. at King David High School. And your assistant rabbi and Baal Tefila at the Holy Law School. So I know you've got some particular ideas of how it should be done, which is one of the reasons why we're keen to have you on the, pan on the panel today. But tell it before that, tell us what made you decide to be rabbi and Baal Tefila. Can I call okay. you Hazan or only Baal Tefila? So I'll, exp I'll explain that, that change of title shortly. First of all, thank you so much for including someone. And you know, I feel honored to be with such a prestigious crowd this evening. Names that I recognize um, from people I listened to on tapes back when I grew up, when I was walking around Jerusalem, um, especially um, Chazan Heinovitz. I davened in the Yeshua and Shul back in the late 1990s when I studied in Yeshiva in Israel. So I, I, your Shul has got a lot of fond memories and it's a big honor to be part of this illustrious group this evening. Got a feeling Alex Klein had a, a lot to do with me being here, so thank you, Alex. Yes, my mother tells me that when I was two years old, no, 18 months, I went to shul as an 18-month-old little boy, and I sat totally quietly, mesmerized, enamored. I actually was born in Southgate and grew up in a shul with a chazan and a choir. And something about being in shul from the age of 18 months, growing up in shul, I think I liked the rabbi, I liked the chazan. So it must have gone into me through osmosis, this, this love for tefillah, for, for, for rabbinics. And I think it was when I was privileged to study in Yeshivat Haaret Sion, known as the Gush, in, in Alon Shavut for a number of years. That's where the Torah side really developed. And I studied with great rabbis, masters of Torah, masters of, of personal ethics and menschlichkeit. And that really gave me a direction of it within of Judaism and it's feel I was I was blessed in I guess in my youth and formative growing up years even as a teenager I was blessed to grow up in Hendon in London in the Nei Israel community which I think as a shul was very very unique in that unlike your previous speaker that spoke about having a shul choir a distinct group who served as the choir growing up I was in a shul where the entire shul was the choir and that, that really transformed the tefillah, that created a very beautiful atmosphere where everyone davened together. And I sat right in the front, I was sat in the row behind the rabbi. So I was close to the rabbi, very close to, to, to whoever was davening. And I learned a lot. Also from my Zayda, um, he davened. So it's in my DNA through genetics. It's in my, my formative years growing up. And as you mentioned, I do have ideas which we'll develop later. Um, I've heard some really good. I've heard some really difficult um, to feel. I'm quite intolerant. Um, I, I, let me just tell, I, I'm quite young. I'm only 43. So I know I have a lot to learn from the illustrious audience here this evening. Um, but I, I do know what I like um, and look forward to sharing more thoughts with you during the evening. Thank you very much, Benji. And I'm glad to say that Asha, Kanta Asha Heinovitz has managed to join us, which is great. Sorry you had difficulty before. Um, but Asher was born in Jerusalem and studied Chazanot under Shlomo Zalman Rivlin. But he mm. also um, studied music in Jerusalem and in London. In Jerusalem at the Rubin Academy of Music and in London at the Royal Academy. So he's been a cantor in South Africa, in Zimbabwe and in London. But quite a number of years ago, he was appointed in the central, as cantor in the Central Yeshurun Synagogue in Jerusalem, which is where he still is. Asher, Asher has recorded uh, the whole of the Nusach for Yamim Naraim, and he has a speciality which not so many Chazanim have, which is loves singing 
Yiddish lead, and uh, which is which has been great. So we have got an excellent group here. Asher, would you like to elaborate a little bit more about what your motivation was in becoming a Chazan? Hello, everybody. I must apologize for being a little bit late. Uh, I, I, I went, I had some eye treatment, so I, I couldn't read very well all the instructions. It, it took me some time, but we managed. Uh, so, your question was, uh, what made me start to get into the world of Hazanot, yes? Yes. As you said, uh, there was an old man in Yerushalayim uh, in the 1940s, 50s, uh, Zalman Rivlin. He, he, he gathered boys to his choir. He loved to teach them the beginnings of, 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 of the prayers and Hazanot. And uh, through the years, many great Hazonim came out of this lovely old man who devoted his life to this uh, project. Uh, I was a teenager when I joined there. And uh, I, I remember they told me, now you should stop singing when your voice is changing. It wasn't easy, but they told me, it's for your benefit. And indeed, later on when I grew up, and I think it was my the age of 17 or so, somebody said to me, why don't you join the Hebrew Academy of Music in Jerusalem, uh, take some uh, voice production lessons, etc. And uh, although I had a, a good knowledge of Hazan, of, I wouldn't say Hazanut, but I would say the Nusa, which you don't learn, but you hear it. You go to shul and you hear the ballet tefillot and you absorb it. And you don't even realize that you're learning it. But the, the general music, you, 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 we didn't have so much in the synagogue. So I, I think I was the only one with a kippah in, in the music academy. And uh, I had a very good uh, voice production teacher. Uh, and of course, uh, I started singing the Aria Antica and all, all the uh, easier stuff. And I'll never forget that uh, later on, uh, we had to sing Mozart's Requiem. I'm, I'm, I'm there with the Kippa singing uh, Domine J. Jesus Christus. You know, it, it, it was something very strange to me. And uh, but I'm glad that <clears throat> I went through these years. <clears throat> I had another teacher uh, who, who taught me the Hazanut, Hassan Polak. And uh, that's the story, actually. I, Baruch Hashem, I had both worlds, also the Jewish part of the music and the general part of the music. I, I, I joined the army. Somebody heard me and he said, there is a position opening in Rhodesia. So this was, these were the years when, when, you, when Africa became, came on the news all the time, Lumumba, different names. And uh, I said to them, what's Rhodesia? They said to me, Rabbi Rabinovitz, who was, I think, the chief rabbi of the of England, the, not of England, but of the empire, Rabbi Rabinovitz. I, I I went to him and uh, he advised me. He says, "Go, you've got nothing to lose." So I accepted it. I stood there for a few years, and then the, politically, the place was unsettled. They wanted the independence, so I moved to South Africa. And then uh, after South Africa, I also felt that times are changing politically. I wanted to come back to Jerusalem and I got a phone call from Edgeware. It was the time when Hazan Alovani left for, La for uh, New York. And they said to me, won't you come to us? I said, I'm on, well, on my way to Israel. And they said, okay, so you stay for a while. And that's what happened. I stayed for four years. 
1977, I joined the insurance show, and here we are. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go now into the meat of our conversation today to talk about Nusach. Now, you may all think you know what Nusach is, and I sort of think I know what Nusach is, but I don't think it's 100% clear. I'm going to ask Jeffrey. Jeffrey, what is Nusach in your view? What is its core and where are its boundaries? Nusach are themes and modes that create and reflect the mood of the occasion. In its very, very simplest and most basic form you can possibly imagine, I would say that Jews don't sing happy melodies at funerals. It's obviously far more sophisticated and far more complicated than that. The point of Nusach is that you should know when you hear a Chazan or a Baal Tefillah who knows what he's doing, and I emphasize that, when you hear such a person, you should know as you walk into the synagogue, you should know what day it is, what day of the week, what day of the year. If you don't, then he's not singing the correct Nusach. And I think what Nusach does is it puts everybody in the right mood for the right occasion. Okay, well, thank you, Kang. That's, that's, that's very clear. And um, I personally go 100% with that. I still think there's difficulty, though. Um, who would like to add? Charles, would you like to make a comment on that, on what you think Nusach is? You need to unmute yourself. Jeffrey has explained it beautifully. Um, uh, so I, I, I prepared something, a little statement, but I think Jeffrey has absolutely nailed it in because he's, well, he's always been an outstanding teacher and you, 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 I hope you paid attention to exactly what Rabbi Shester just told you. So in my, in my words, I would say, taking my definition from Eric Werner, Nusach is the traditional application of synagogue melodies to the liturgy. And then a couple more things I'm going to add. Nusuch has the purpose, so here's my thing, I'm going, I might come back to it later, that Nusuch has a purpose, and therefore, uh, if you, when, when we argue, is that this is no, we can sing that, because can we sing this, can we sing that? What you have to have in mind is, does what you're singing fulfill a specific purpose of making you aware where you are, uh, where you are united with other people the time you are which is exactly what Jeffrey just said Nusuk has the purpose of uniting the community through a shared awareness of time and place it is the result of a thousand years of selection there is no un universal Nusuk but there is a universal concept of Nusuk and the point is this, this is what I'm going to come to um, I, how much time have I got because a couple of things that do you I mean you can carry on for a moment I, 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 I want to get it. Yeah, because it may be what I'm going to say will come up later, but I'll, I'll carry on. You tell me when to stop. So basically, what that's what Nusach is, and it has a, a function, as Jeffrey just told you. And um, the, the point is, my, my, my shtick here, why I'm happy to be here, is because there, there has to be, we have to move ahead, and we have to do something about it, we have to take action. We, we not just talk about Nusach, but actually do something about it. You've just heard very clearly from uh, one of our speakers, from, Rab from Asher, who said that you can't, it's not easy to teach, but you know what it is when you hear it all the time. Therefore, we need to maintain it as a living tradition. So that's why we should have a society for the preservation of Nusach, and we should have a website, which should be called Nusach.com, something like that. Benji, would you like to add anything? I'm, I'm really after... Um, not just, as Jeffrey said, you can, you, you can hear it and therefore you know what day of the week it is, what day of the year it is, uh, which is great. Um, I'm after, do you have a comment, any comments on where, where Nusach, has, what, where its core is and where its boundaries are? So I think the boundaries might be in the tension between the purpose of it versus the tradition of it. So there's a, I, I agree that there's a purpose to 
certain melodies and it puts you in the right frame of mind. And there's, you know, I'll say nothing so jarring, but of course there is. But within, within this context, you know, it, it's, it's jarring when I was in a shawl for a number of years and they wanted to give everybody a chance to daven. And the person went forward and he would finish every Shabbos Musaf Kedusha and end up in the Yontov tune. And it used to drive me nuts because it's the wrong tune and it does, it's not Yontov, it's Shabbos. And it, and it just took you into the wrong emotional place. So that's quite jarring. But so there's a purpose of the, of the melody, creating the atmosphere and interpreting the piece. And as Jeffrey said, you don't sing happy tunes at a funeral, but I've been in enough um, Stiebel type shuls in different times in my, in my life to hear Slicha's tunes sung for Hallel. And that's part of the problem when you're singing some, some deep, gut-wrenching piece of Slicha's for Zehayom HaSah Hashem, Nagila Venismachabo, it's the completely the wrong mood. But I think the tension between the purpose versus a traditional melody, tradition for who, and for, for an older generation, there are certain pieces that are traditional that are unknown to the younger generations. And then you've got the tension, I think, between what, what is purposeful for a younger generation may not be purposeful for an older generation, and that desire to bring that tradition to the younger, but it's, the, it's that tension between do we try and maintain it forever, because this is who we are, or is there a, can we adapt and move forward, but bearing in mind that the, whatever tune you move to needs to have a, the purpose of interpreting the text and setting the mood. Okay, Let, let's have Asher give Asher, Asher a, a possibility of commenting on this. It's very difficult to add because what we heard until now is, 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 is very true. Uh, I, I would also say that Nusaf is the foundation. I, I'm talking about Ashkenazi Nusaf. We are talking over time. Yes. For us, it's it's the foundation of the prayers. It's, 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 the, it's the ways. It, it, you, you want to, to, to know where you are. It's, it's your guideline. And Nusach, it, it, it's simple, and yet you have to know it. And then Chazanut, you can build on top of the Nusach. Nusach is foundation, and the Chazanut is higher uh, levels. Um, Nusach is, is the mode, uh, as we said, Nusach, there is a Nusach for weekdays, there is a Nusach for Shabbat, there is a Nusach for Kabbalat Shabbat, there is a Nusach for Mincha Shabbat. Everything is Nusach. And, uh, but one thing that worries me very much, and it's not only in, in Israel, it's I think spreading all over the world, You mentioned the uh, slichot. Of course, slichot, there is a certain mode, a certain musa for slichot. And recently, the young people, they take guitars and other equipments, music equipments, and they make it a happening. And hundreds and hundreds of young people are joining it, and they enjoy it. It's very well, but Nusach of Slichot will be forgotten. So, also the, with the virus, with the corona recently, that we, we hope that we're getting out of it soon, uh, something happened to Nusach. Until now, the Hazan was in shul and the people came, whatever, whatever tens or, or more. And the Hazan was the one who is responsible. All of a sudden, everybody dances in his courtyard and, and every, everybody is the Balkhila. Some of them know the Nusach and they carry on. Some of them don't know the Nusach and people listen to it and they think that's the thing. That's how, how, how we teach Nusach it's again, if you listen to somebody who does the right thing, you learn the Nusaf. It, it, it's, it's not complicated, but you have to know it. Yeah. Uh, okay, some Nusafs are more complicated if, if, if they ask you the Kaddish for Tal and the Kaddish for Neila. Okay, but generally it's not uh, so uh, complicated, but 
you have to listen to it and, and to realize that this is the Nusa for weekdays, and this is Nusa for Shabbat, and this is Nusa for Gimal uh, Regalim, and this is Nusa Yamim Rayim, etc. So let's come back to, to you, Jeffrey. Um, we obviously understand the basic of what Nusach is for, but do you think Nusach matters always? Are there occasions when it's okay not to be in Nusach? Are there occasions where, are, are, are the things that are the right thing to sing, even though it's not part of the Nusach? It's a very interesting question, because I think that Nusach, you can only be sensitive to Nusach if you know what Nusach is, if you know what Nusach should be. Now, I taught, um, I still teach Nusach, I've taught for my whole career. And I always used to start by telling my students, uh, as soon as, uh, virtually on our first lessons together, I would say, uh, I'm warning you that these lessons are going to upset you. And they said, what are you talking about? I say, well, they're going to upset you because you're going to learn what I was taught by a master, Reverend Leo Brilzik and Oli Rachel, and I'm passing on to you what he taught me. You're going to go into shuls and you're going to hear people do things that are completely different. And the fascinating thing about Nusach is when you hear somebody doing the wrong Nusach, it hurts. It physically hurts. You sit there and you say, Oi, vey, what, what is going on here? This, it actually has an emotional and physical, it makes a, an emotional and physical impact on you. It can only matter to people who are sensitive to it in the first place. The value of Nusach is, as I think Charles alluded to a moment ago, which is absolutely spot on, it is unifying. You can go into any Ashkenazi shul anywhere in the world and if, if the Baltfila knows what he's doing, you're at home. I think the Havdil Elif Havdalot, one of the biggest mistakes that the Catholic Church made was when they scrapped the use of Latin. One of the most important, most phenomenal, two of the most important things that we've done, and Baruch Hashem, we've kept to absolutely religiously, is every shul that you go into will govern in Hebrew, even progressive communities they will have some Hebrew in their services and we will have the same Nusach. I've, I, had, I can remember going um, to Russia many, many years ago and I went with a very close colleague of mine, Rabbi Eddie Jackson, who some of you I hope will know, and we went to the great synagogue in Moscow, in Arkhipova Street. And I remember that uh, we were sitting in shul and listening to the, to the davening, I actually could have been in my, in my own shul on any shul, certainly any shul in London that I knew of. It was identical. And I turned to, to Rabbi Jackson, I said, they're singing our Nusach. And I said, hold on a second. No, perhaps we're singing their Nusach because they've probably been singing it in Russia for longer than we were singing it. But the wonderful thing was how you sit in the shul so far away and you are absolutely totally at home they're singing the same modes they may have different melodies i hope this is something we will come on to shortly because it's a terribly important distinction tunes yeah. and nusach are not the same i won't i won't address that question now because i know you want to talk about that later but they yeah. are totally different things when you hear the same mode if you go into shul and you hear on Shabbat or Yom Tov or any of the Chagim or Rosh Hashanah, you hear the mode that you are used to, you are at home. You feel comfortable. I always say to my students, you have to make your congregation feel like they're sitting in a beautiful, comfortable armchair. They're relaxed, they're happy, they're comfortable because they're at home. Everything that's going on, going on around them is familiar. It's what they expect and what they want and what they need and what gives them spiritual satisfaction. That to me is Nusach. Okay. Ben Benji, let me come to you this, this time. Um, how, does, how does your uh, congregation react to Nusach? Is it, is it important to them? Um, 
Alex, you behave you know, yourself. I saw your eyes just there because I know you know things about our community. Um, I think what Jeffrey said before was correct. I think it was Jeffrey that you know, Nusach is, you know, you're, you're, if you're the chazan or the baltzfila, you're like the chef that has the recipe in your head and you know exactly how much it each spice is necessary. But if you're an amateur and you don't know what's missing, then you're not going to pick it up. So for those that recognize certain sounds as being authentic for the occasion, then I think that's really important to them. There are certain things that I think are beyond Nusach, as we just was alluded to, in terms of tunes. And when I had the temerity to suggest a tune was changed from something that's been done for a long time, then that was met with quite a lot of opposition. But that wouldn't come into Nusach. That's just a tune that's used. I think they do appreciate the correct sound. When you, you know you start off on a shacharit on a on a yom tov with you know in a certain way, and, and yom kippur is different and shabbat's different. If I would mix that, someone did that to me actually. Someone who didn't know, someone who thought they were being helpful, started singing the 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 Rosh Hashanah yom kippur melody for Baruch Hu, the first night of Shavuot. Now, bearing in mind in Manchester, Shavu at Shavuot was about quarter past ten for those living in different parts of the world. So most people are quite tired by then. I looked at him and said, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to put me off completely? He was trying to be helpful, but he didn't know. But that would have been awful to have set, to have created the Rosh Hashanah mood when it was a festive mood of, of Shavuot. So I think the, the Nusach is, is fundamental to those that know. Those that don't know, I think they want the person leading the service to, as to take them by the hand and lead them on this journey, this emotional journey that we create for them. And if they know that you know, then they fill in that safe space that Jeffrey just spoke about. They don't like it when the person at the front is a bit unsure or uncertain and wavers as they're singing because they're not quite sure how to, how to sing the piece or how, how, to, how to execute it. So if you're certain, then you do create that calmness in the room that then allows for the various emotions to be to be affected, um, serious, emotional, joyful, whatever you're trying to create. Okay, thank you for that. Charles, do you have a comment on this? On how congregation congregations really react to Nusach? Do they react positively? Do they well, react? We've had a few people with the experience that if you know if you if you know the Nusach and you hear the wrong Nusach, it's, it's physically painful. I'll give you an example. In my shul in Bethel with Louis Danto, this was in, it wouldn't happen now, but this happened, let's say, mm, getting on for 40 years ago. We had a congregation, we would have hundreds of people in the shul uh, with Chazan Danto as the, as the Chazan. So one day, if, if there was, I, whatever it was, uh, for whatever reason, the Chazan and the choir weren't, it was on the Yontif. Uh, it was, no, what was, what was the thing? It was, it, it was like whatever it was. It was a regular Shabbos, and a bolt for the one of the one of the Balabatim got up. They said, "You want a daven? Is he daven?" And he started to sing um, at the beginning of the Musaf. It was a regular Shabbos, and he started to sing um, the Nusach of Geshem, which he knew very well. And all hundreds of people laughed out loud. Now that's the kind of response you want. The whole, it's not just a few experts knew it was the wrong tune. It was the whole shul felt, it was as if his pants had fallen down. That is what the power of Nusach is. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So I don't know if, if shut me up. I have a few things to say and tell me when to stop. Go on, key, you go. Thank you. A key question that we keep coming around and around is like, well, you know what? They want to introduce new tunes. Why should we have the old tune? We all know that what we know as Nusach at one time was a new tune. Every, every Nusach, every tune we have was new at some time. Um, but hundreds of years later, it's, it's totally accepted. So the issue is how do things become acceptable? And um, the, the trouble, the argument we have these days, people say, um, uh, we, we're up against Balabati, members of the congregation, when the Chazan tries to sing the right Nusach, people go up to it. People who don't know, of course, they go up and say, we don't want these old tunes. Um, th here's our problem. So people say, we don't want these old tunes, we want new tunes. The, the danger is, 
if we give them just the new tunes that they want, who's going to cater for all the people who do want the old tunes? <coughs> so this is where it comes back to uh, my problem of, of having some kind of organization which will maintain it. It's not good enough to say um, the uh, old, we don't want these old tunes, uh, let's just have new tunes because we, we, the congregation is going to be evangelized. There are people who know what the tradition is and there has to be uh, a way of, um, of maintaining it. Oh, I'd like to pursue, Asha, the, 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 the thing about tunes because some tunes are age old, right? So Kol Nidre goes back a long way. Um, Olenu on um, the Yomim no Rhyme. Everybody knows this. It's sung just about everywhere. Um, is, an, is an old tune that's established like that, should, should we regard that as part of Nusach and, and it's therefore uh, immutable? Or, or, do, we, or do, we, do we say new tunes can come in um, just as well and, be re and replace them? What 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 does it have? What does a tune have to be for it to qualify as being part of Nusach, and and, and you shouldn't change it? As you mentioned, uh, everybody will agree that if you will bring another melody for Polidre, even if it's it will be most beautiful, it will be unacceptable. Because Polidre is Polidre, but not everybody knows that other places during uh, the services are also what we call Missinai, they are holy and you don't touch them. And as I mentioned uh, in our previous session, there is today in Israel, I don't know if it's in other places, on Yom Naroim, there are some places where the people forget the Nusach and I mentioned Ochila Loel. Ochila Loel, Ochalefono, ta ta ta. That's Nusa. Somebody wrote a beautiful melody, really beautiful melody to Ochila Loel. It started in the yeshivas. You know, you don't think it, it, it started somewhere where they don't know. In, 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 in the yeshivot. Ochila Loel, Ochalef. It's beautiful, but it's got nothing to do with Nusa. And as I mentioned last time, I had a problem in my synagogue. People wanted it. So I made a compromise. I let somebody, I, I did the Nusa. And I let somebody from the congregation who is musical to lead the crowd into that melody. So everybody was happy. So you can also please the crowd as long as you keep to your tradition. Now, Nusach, it has to do with the mode. S certain things you can sing Frigis and you can bring in different melodies, but as long as you are in Frigis, certain things you must be in major, etc. And also it's the endings the endings of the phrase of the of, of this of, of, of this uh, phrase or, or of the term is more. For example, Kabbalah Shabbat. We always speak yes, Kalibach, no Kalibach. Lechun Ranen Ola Shem, etc. Asher Nishbati Beapi, ta 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 ti ta ta ta. You can see in Kalibach all through. But when you come to the final line, bring it, bring in that Nusa. Nothing wrong. But if you don't do it, it will be forgotten. Uh, then Nusa also helps you to remind people today's Rosh Chodesh. Today's Rosh Chodesh. How do you remind people? So some people, Schultz, they bang the tables and the people, oh yes, of course, you should say Yana Biyobo. And then some, they do ta 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 Oh, yes, it's a shoulder. So Nusach is also, it shows you the way. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. all for the moment. Yeah. 
Okay, so Benji, that, let's ask. Let's ask you. What about melodies? When the melodies become nusach, are melodies nusach? Is it okay to change any melody? Oof. It's I think not melodies, that easy, is it? No, it's very difficult, and I think there's a tension between the intellect and the heart. I think there are things you like to hear because it makes you feel grounded. And I think in the same way that we teach, that there's a power in everybody saying the same words of the tefillah, that there are Jews all over the world saying the same text and that unifies, there is very much a power in the melody that unifies, that you can be transported to any place in the world and feel connected to different Jews in different countries. And there's, there's a certain power in that and a beauty doing that. I think, yes, let's use the Kaabach conundrum for the moment because it was just brought up. It, it does get rather tedious week in, week out, hearing the same, the same tune, the same style for Kabbalah Shabbat. That's almost become a Nusach all of its own but it's become strong-armed, as if, as if the Nusach Kalbach has become a synonym for, we're going to do this in a spiritual way, we're going to do this in a nice way. So it's because the tunes have become, or saying you're going Kalbach has become an expression of, we're going to put more into it than you would do if you just sung, quote, the traditional Nusach. And I don't think that is necessarily true at all. I think you're right, tunes obviously were introduced at a certain point, they were all born by whoever composed the tune. And over time, they became part of what we do. I think at the base of it, there's a tension between the emotional connection versus intellectually, if a tune takes me to the same place or a similar place as the original Nusach can in part, then perhaps there's room for a innovation and a change but you're limited with a new tune because it won't take you to that sense of connectivity and tradition, but it might take you to the same emotional place, experience place. But then there's the intellect saying you're changing and you're not allowing the new generation to be blessed with our traditions. So I do think ultimately it comes down to a tension between heart and brain as to which one wins over. And an anecdote will take only a few seconds. My brother shared this with me many years ago that there's a, a you know, Israel's got all these immigrants coming in and trying to create communities. And there's a tension in Israel, let's say in many Ashkenazi shul, I know Nusach Anglia may not have it in it, but adding in the Shir Ma'alot before, um, just after Yishtabach on Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah time. That's a very emotive piece. You open the Aram Kodesh, people feel the Vilna Gaon said, you shouldn't do it. Don't change the text of the Siddur. But for many people, it's very emotional to open the ark at that moment and see the Sifrei Torah all in white and people connect. So there's an emotional versus an intellectual tension in how we do things. And to find that balance, I think, is a question that I, for sure, am not suitable to answer. It's okay, let me, me. Let, me turn to, let me turn to Jeffrey, because Jeffrey, you have composed many melodies for, for pieces of the tefillah. Um, when you compose a piece and when you introduce the piece, do you make sure that, that it's within the mode of the, of the day, the occasion when it's going to be sung? How, how, do, how do you make it fit? What way does it, does it work? Will you allow me just to go back one second? Because I think we are confusing melodies and nusach. And they're not the same thing at all. Nusach, I, will, I would leave to Charles to explain technically the, all the ins and outs and the nuances of how you would define Nusach from a musical point of view. But Nusach are modes. Nusach is, is not a melody as such. I always, I always explain that Nusach exists. To me, it exists in a box. And as long as you stay within that box, you can go anywhere you like. But well, once you go outside that box, you're outside of the Nusach. And there are some people who are clever enough to go outside the box and come back. I have to say, when I hear those people, I still feel very uncomfortable while they're outside the box. You have to stay in the box. If you stay in whichever box it is for a particular Nusach, if you stay within that, you can do anything you like. 
Now, melodies are completely different. As a very obvious example, Kedusha. You can sing anything you like for the Kedusha. You can sing a basic Nusach if you want. You would continue with the basic Shabbat Nusach, but it's an accepted thing that you are given license to go outside completely and sing a tune. Debbie Friedman's Haftalah is not Nusach. It's a very, very beautiful and attractive tune. Kol Nidre, I would say, is also an Olenu. They're not Nusach. They are, they are melodies, Misenai. They are very ancient melodies. Some of these melodies, we have no idea what their origin is. All we can say, you know, in the same way that rabbis talk about Halakha le Moshe Misenai, when we don't really, for example, uh, tefillin. Nobody knows where the actual details of tefillin come from. So we say, well, it's halakha la Moshe Misenai. That's how Moshe wore tefillin, and you pass it down from one generation to the next. It's not written down in the Talmud, where you have to put inside a, bo a, a boxes for tefillin, or that you have to make boxes. Chazanim had exactly the same situation. They found over many, many centuries particular certain melodies that just were always in use. I'm not talking about Nusach. I'm talking about melodies. It's recorded that the Jews, um, who were certain Jews were put to death. Uh, I can't remember what it was. They were being burned in France. And it was recorded they were singing Aleinu. Now, whether they were singing the identical Aleinu that we're singing, I don't know, but they were singing an Aleinu that was very well known. It may well be that they were singing the melody that we know, the melody we accept as Aleinu. But these are not, these are not Nusach. They are traditional melodies. Some of them, we can make some associations with. Ma'os Tzur, for example. Now, even Idelson can't actually tie down exactly where Ma'os Tzur comes from. But he'll tell you it's based on this, and it's based on that, and it seems to be developed from this idea who for Pesach. They're not Nusach. Okay. They are traditional melodies. We have to distinguish between them. Yep. In that sense... Now, but in that sense, there are certain things for which, if it's a traditional melody, you have to stick to it. If there's no traditional melody associated with Kedusha, with Adon Olam, with Enkel of Canaan, with all sorts of things, if there's no traditional melody, you can sing whatever you like, as long, and I think this is a very sensitive point, as long as it's appropriate. I've heard a chasten sing Yismach of Malchutcha to If I Was a Rich Man. I can't remember. It was just stus. He was doing it to make people amused. I said to him, why don't you sing My Old Man's Adustment? It's just as good. But you, people do, do exactly that sort of thing. I don't, I don't like it either. But they're making let me, choices. Let me they're turn. making choices of the service, that's all. It, 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 they are, what are they, what the problem, you see, the major problem I have with this thing, when people introduce a new melody, not a new melody, sorry, they introduce a known melody, is you stop thinking about the tefillah, the words are completely irrelevant, and everybody sits and is amused because the chazan is singing my Yiddish mama to the Kedusha. So it's amusing. It's nothing to do with the Kedusha. It's not, relevant. It's, not, it's, it's not relevant to the Kedusha. It's not appropriate for the Kedusha. It's amusing. Who are Lokenu, who are Vino Lokenu? Nothing to do with my Yiddish mama. It's fun. So you forget about, what am I saying? Who are Lokenu? Who are Vinu? Who are Lokenu? That's what matters. Okay. All to, right. The melody has to be appropriate. Okay, Jeffrey, I get, I get your point. Ch Charles, do you, do you agree, though? Do you agree mm -hmm. that um, melody is not part of Nusach? Uh, I understand. Well, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just <laughs> going to say that every, do I agree with what Jeffrey said? 100%. Everything he says is beautifully expressed and he's absolutely right. Now, I, I want to pursue a couple of things. The, the problem is what we're dealing with, and it's been mm. pointed out, we're dealing with um, two, two issues. A democratization, meaning everybody in the shul thinks they can have a turn. And the other is ignorance. Most of the people simply don't know. So I want to, this, I want to expand on this. One of the uh, <clears throat> objections that we get uh, we, all right, we are the, the Nusach, uh, we're on the, the Nusach camp. 
and the Nusach warriors. Now, people come up to us and say, you only want to keep old tunes, to which the answer is, no, I don't. And so they said, well, you mean you can have new tunes? Yes, of course, you can have new tunes, like Jeffrey said, if they're appropriate. So then say, well, who's going to decide if it's appropriate? So the question is, we all decide. And there is a test. This is what I'm coming up to. And it's based on connected to what Jeffrey said before. We all decide whether it's appropriate. You can have your new tunes so long as it passes the test. There is a test. The test is, does your tune promote the function of Nusach? And what's the function of Nusach? The function of Nusach is to promote a shared awareness of time and place. And we can demonstrate whether your tune has met the test. And we, I gave you the example of the, where the whole show laughed out loud when the tune was wrong. Jeffrey and other, uh, Alex Klein mentioned, talked about um, cases where they feel the physical pain. Um, I now want to, I, I've made a list of, of about eight examples and, and you have to decide whether they meet the test or not. And we can do that later if we have time at the end. Uh, we'll have a quiz. Now, I, I would now want to try something else. I'm going to, to show you where I'm coming from, what's, what we're really talking about. And this is a thought experiment. So here's my thought experiment. And I want you to think about this. Let's supposing you go to the Royal Shakespeare Theater, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they, you are going to see Shakespeare performed by the Royal Shakespeare Company or the Globe Theater. There's no question this is shaky. And you're sitting there waiting for it to start. But just before it starts, the rabbi comes on the stage. And the rabbi says, my friends, many of you are going to find this four hour play too long. And many of the words are very hard. So what we've done is we've decided to cut a lot of it out. And instead of that, we're going to invite you to join me in singing Yabi Babi Babi. Okay, what would you do? Would you demand your money back? That's my question. That's, that's my point. I would. This is the situation. Now, now, this is exactly the situation. Now you have to think, why would you want your money back? You're going to hear Yabi Babi. Everybody is going to clap and sing, and the rabbi is going to lead you. It's always a rabbi, because I've got here, um, no offense to the rabbi, but here's my uh, advertisement. Midnight Salichas a few years ago. Midnight Salichas, led by the chief rabbi, a unique spiritually energizing experience. Uh, there you go. No booking necessary. So there you go. What could be better than Midnight Salichas led by the chief rabbi? Now, this, uh, I know that recently there's been a wonderful Midnight Salichas with the rabbi and the, and the, and the choir. It was, it was very nice on YouTube. But this is what we have to, what we're dealing with. So my example of the Shakespeare, you have to apply that. You have to think, why would you want your money back at Shakespeare? And why don't you want your money back when people want to update the, the Nusach and service? Okay, over to you. <laughs> okay, I'm not here to answer the questions. I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. But I'll, I'll just give you my one word answer. Expectations. If, you, if, if you're expecting Shakespeare, like you're expecting the, the right Nusach and somebody comes in with something completely different, you think this is not right. Um, you've cheated me. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's expectation people are invested. P I'll tell you why, expectations. Because the audience has studied Shakespeare. The expectations is right. They know what Shakespeare is and they want to hear it. So because we have uh, congregations who don't know what Nusach is, they, um, the, the, like you say, all right, expectations. They, they don't know what it is, so they think they can change it. But uh, as we've said, there are ways of getting people educated. Remember what I said before, I, I heard this from a professor, Amalia Kedem in Hebrew University. She says our two enemies at the moment are democratization uh, which really means dumbing down. I could talk a bit about that. I have a whole thing on dumbing down in society in the whole world at the moment. We could come to that if you want to pursue it. But this is a major problem which affects everything, social media, TV, newspapers, everything. Um, and democratization and ignorance, they are your enemies. 
Yeah, yeah. Asha. Yeah. Um, do you think mel melodies are interchangeable? Do you think melodies, apart from one or two, um, you can have anything you like, or should should they be traditional? Should they be um, ones that the congregation knows from 50 years ago? What do you think? Yeah, it, it depends. I see soul zoom with us. So the whole world will sing souls. Yes, this is already Nusa. You bring me another Avinu, I'll say, well, it's, it's, it's not as good as this one. It's already Nusa. Uh, so you do, you do think that melodies are part of Nusa? It's becoming a Nusa, yes. And, 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 and so that, is that, that's not, that's not based on Nusa. It is not based on Nusa. I didn't base it on Nusa. I based it on creating a mood for what a prayer was and taking the words and making them come alive through what I did. There is no such thing as Nusa for a prayer. Yes, you could say that a prayer should be very solemn. Should it be uh, a... Uh... No, we know that. That's Nusach. Well, I don't, I don't want to interrupt any flow. I do have my own opinion on a lot of the things. I agree with a lot of the things that were said today. I've only written five books on Nusach, five, 400 pages each, and I live Nusach. I, I am opposed to not having Nusach. I believe that Nusach should be part. It, it should be always part of, of our tefillah. That, that's not Nusach. No, this is... <laughs> anyway, so... Well, okay, th my point, my... All right, if, 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 only if you want me to say something. No, no, I, I did. And it was good what you said. And uh, you're, you're, you're well known. You're, you're famous for your tunes. Not just, no, not but it's not, it's not tunes. Tunes have nothing to do it should be in the, the realm of Nusach. However, today in the world of, if we're talking uh, Amcha, I'm not talking only England. I'm not talking only Europe. I'm talking Amcha. It's being changed tremendously. There is an American Nusach. And what is that Nusach? Do what you want. Mm, well that's why why but why is that where is it coming from do you know where it's coming from because in many of the synagogues they are not having they are not having chazanim mm. it, even in england i'm sure there are synagogues that say we don't need a chazan i okay. don't think that's right no. however that's what's happening and we should be nusach is based on on really motifs Every Nusach has motifs, whether it's everybody recognize that. We all recognize the Nusach for whichever Nusach it would be. Whether it's Kol Nidre is not a melody. It was, yes, it was a melody created, but it, can you, I know that Nobody's going to try and change it, but it's based on the same motif being put into different words, into different words of that prayer. Okay, so, so th thank you, thank you, Sol. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, Sol just uh, said, Whose fault is this? I, I actually believe this is the fault of the Gaboy, uh, this is the fault of lay people. Our, our problem today is that lay people don't know what Nusach should be. If you go back even 50 years ago, 50, 60, 70 years ago for sure, anybody who stood on the bimmer who sang the wrong thing, the governor would throw him out. The chairman would say, get off this bimmer, you're not fit to be here. The Gaboim knew what the Nusach should be. And the Rabbonim knew what the Nusach should be. The problem we have today is that neither the Gaboim nor most of the Rabbonim 
know or care what the Nusuk should be. My body is not interested in Nusuk. My body is just interested, gets through the service. And I look, I'm a rabbi too. Right, so I'm not talking against my bonim, but most of the bonim don't know Nusuk. I taught Nusuk at Jews College to the trainee Rabonim for a number of years. Most of them didn't know anything about it. It's not important to them. And the problem, I think the, one of the major problems we have today is that the people who run shuls, rabbis and Gaboim, don't know Nusuk. If they did, they would only allow people to stand on a bimmer who knew Nusach. And it does bother me when people say they knew they know Nusach because they've picked it up. You can pick up measles as well. <laughs> they, they All right, Charles. Them. Charles. Well, just yeah, listening to somebody, you're listening. How do they know the person they're listening to who's never been, who's never been trained, he's never been to another cousin for lessons, he's never been to an institution where he can learn Nusach? How do they know that he's singing it properly? This is yeah. the problem. This there is, is a, my, there, there is the major surely, problems. There is surely a problem there. Charles. Yeah, I just want to say, I'm glad we had um, Sol talking. I've personally davened with, with Sol as a chazan on Shabbos. I've been in the congregation. And there's no question with his tune. We wouldn't know him for his tunes. And there's no question he is a master of, of what we would recognize as traditional Nusach. And it was a phenomenal experience. There's no question what he's talking about. But here's my question. The question was, what is the Nusach for Avino Bashir Bashamayim? So my answer is, how did Zulsa in Vienna sing Avino Shabashamayim? And the answer is, uh, hello, there wasn't a, it's just a modern thing. So it therefore, wasn't. it's perfectly legitimate to sing Sol's tune. It's become modern Nusach for a modern tefillah. So there's my answer. There, that's it. Over it's to you. Nusach. Okay, but, but, it's but not what? Nusach. It's a magnificent melody. It's not Nusach. Yeah, but it fits. It's not. My point is, nobody gets hurt. You've got a new text with yeah. a new that everybody loves and no damage is done and everybody please loves it. Please forgive Asher. me. Please okay, forgive. okay. Let, let's, let's Asha wants to come in. Subject. Do you know that the, I sing and you sing probably the same an old Russian melody to Ayla Donald Kolamar sing? It's an old Russian melody and everybody sings it and it's uh, it's okay. Ayla Donald Kolamar sing. We can all sing it together. You sing the Chadodi for a thousand melodies, if it's minor, 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 major, friggy, or whatever, because you can sing the Chadodi. But certain things. Okay, okay, but perhaps there are places where this doesn't work. It may work with. Um, everybody knows that there are many, many tunes and we're choosing just, do we want this tune, do we want that tune? But there is a matter of appropriateness. Or do you not, do you not think there's a matter of appropriateness? You, you have to be in the right mode. Oh. You have to be in the right mode. And certain places you have to, to have the exact melody. Certain places you can have a different melody, but you're in the right mode. So you have to know these things. Benji, ben, so, Forgive me. Ben Benji, do you want to come in on this? I think, again, as I said to you before, I think we have, we, shul services are not well attended in the big communities anymore. As a high school Jewish studies teacher, I, I observed a lesson yesterday. This might make a lot of you very shocked. I observed a lesson yesterday where the teacher asked Jewish children non-practicing in the main um, what is the definition of a minyan? And a boy put up his hand, most of the class had forgotten the, the word, put up his hand, that's what you do at a shiva house. Oh. And it was a moment of, I mean, you could say Baruch Hashem, he knew something, um, but how tragic when the, the youth of today associate prayer with what you do in a shiva house and not what you do to experience the lifeblood of being Jewish and connecting to a community and to a heritage. And I think at some point, we need to try and discover the formula for bringing children into back in young people, teenagers, back <laughs> into shul. And I, I had the fortune, and it was a learning experience to, to again, well, I, I'm from a shiver, to, to do a shiver some time ago. 
And I walked in and I thought, it's going to be one of those where I leave the service and it's a bit of a pretend. We don't really have a trila going on. Everybody will stand there holding a sidor. But to my shock, all the kippot came out. The, the men knew what to do. And then I looked at them and I thought to myself, you know what to do because you were trained. You were pushed in your generation in school. The skills were impressed into you. The tragedy is that your children won't know what to do for you because you're not passing that on to the generation. So I think, yes, Nusuch is very important, but we also have to try and find a way of bringing the next generation into shul. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of very happy octogenarians who are very satisfied that the right sounds are being made, but it will be a big echo in the room because there won't be enough bodies to absorb the sound. And that's a different angle to explore. Is the, the, yeah, the, the bridge between Nusuch and how to attract a younger generation who are, who are not relating. And the relating is not because they can't read Hebrew. And they, I know Alex would agree with me. We've had this conversation before. Fundamentally, you've got to believe that when you're davening, you're talking to the Almighty. And that is a concept that is difficult to teach, difficult to experience. And if you don't believe that, then why would you just go and talk to yourself for a couple of hours on a Shabbos morning? Part of the problem, perhaps, is that people think that bringing in popular tunes will bring in, pop bring in the community, and therefore we should have popular tunes rather than, rather than having tr traditional tunes, rather than having... Now, the Nusak doesn't matter to them. What's, all they want is nice tunes. But I fear that with, if you sing a nice tune... Um, then you, I do think that you can lose the focus of the words that you are singing. So let's take Mim Komcha on Shabbat morning for Kedusha for Shacharit. Whatever tune I use, I try and make sure it is a tune that is related to Yerushalayim. So one of the many tunes for Im Imesh Gachech. It has to be a tune that has some supplicative feeling. Matai Timloch B'Tzion. It can't be a happy, clappy, because the words aren't expressing happiness, they're expressing longing. And if you sing a tune for other parts of Kedusha, you might find yourself dabbling in a, you know, it's very tempting to sing Joseph and the Technicolor theme, um, the, 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 the dream coat for the parish yacht in Bereshit when, those, when that story's being led. But then you're going to get people imagining they're in the theater watching the production, mm. and they're going to be thinking about the actors and actresses and maybe not Hashem and rebuilding of the base, I make gosh. So I think there is a, I do think there's this tension that goes through my mind all the time, making sure that the piece is relevant to express the words that are being said, but finding that piece, but not getting sidetracked and getting confused at what you're listening to and going off into a dream world. We all know how easy it is to dream when you're davening. You know, you start the Amida, you're not quite sure what happens in the middle and all of a sudden you finished it. So that's a very easy journey to go on. So from there, if that journey is easy to go on, it's very easy to go on a journey of getting lost in a tune and start singing Erev Shoshanim and thinking about a guitar and roses and a love song rather than a Kedusha, singing it to, to Musaf on a Shabbos for Kedusha, which it fits very nicely, but it might get you knocked off the words that you're actually saying. So there is that tension, and I don't really think there's an, a solution to resolve it, or that I worked out a solution at this stage, but... Happy to learn from the experts. <laughs> okay. Asher. The famous melody, they love it. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. Beautiful. And they love it. And it fits in. It does fit in. Absolutely. That's what... Uh, may, I, may I interrupt? Yes, thank you, may so. Okay. Uh, you know, I happen to agree with you, Benji, but the, the thing that you say, well, they all of a sudden are going to sing something else. I think it's only because they don't know something else. They don't know the, forget about them not knowing the dosa. So they say, I know a tune. Oh, and it fits, it fits these words. I can fit, not the meaning of the words, but it fits. Oh, I can see I can fit it in. Oh, I can make it fit wrong it shouldn't be done that way and there's and there are not enough people who know how to put it together to make it fit because number one as i said you can take the melody and put also the nusach within it 
I have so many areas that, that I that that I have done it, and I and I've I've made it my purpose to do it in a melody. And yet somebody will say, call me and say, "But you know, Saul, you didn't put something in. Uh, you uh, you started off in the minor rather than in the freakish." Well, of course. I know that I go to I, I went to the Fragish because I know it's supposed to be a habarabba that goes into the minor, or I could start minor and go into the Fragish. Now you may know what I'm talking about. The average person doesn't, but I know I stick within the Dusach. And melody and con and congregational mel uh, and nusach hatfila are two different things. Mm. Okay. There two. It should be within the framework of Nusach. However, there are two separate things. We should try to get. Look, I'm a believer in Nusach and I, I I feel it should always be there for all of us. If you go into a more uh, in a conservative synagogue or a reform synagogue. They will not know what it is. They'll know the melodies. They'll think that to them, that's become their nusach. Exactly. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that because that gives them the the ruach that they want to feel. If and if you go if into it, a small, if it's chosen appropriately, so if it's chosen appropriately, uh, of course. But that's the way it works. I. Mm. Uh, if I've seen are, if, if you are in the right mode, then and then it can fit the right nusa. Not I agree. every not every place you have to sing da 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 da. That's nusa. But sometimes it's enough if you do a beautiful thing that fits into the text in the right and, mode. And, That's also nusa. Okay, Jeffrey, do you do you make a point of? the music that you compose to fit the the mode of the day it would be used on well of course yeah i, I try to okay so so you you you, you think that the, the the melody has to relate to the nusach of the day I think, well not necessarily i think the melody has to relate to the occasion it doesn't okay. have to be that not every after all I, I, the <clears throat> obvious examples are Don Olam, Enkel Okenu, Kedusha. They don't necessarily relate to any particular Nusach. Correct. And melodies. They're uh, tunes. Uh, they're tunes. Uh, and there's uh, nothing wrong with that. Charles? You're muted again. Yes, I always mute myself. Um... I have nothing to add at this stage, uh, really. Uh, everything's uh, one. Point, the only point that we keep coming back to, I, this is an underlying theme, is that people, the, the, the oilam, the balabatim, the, the crowd, come in and say, "We we don't want your tunes. There's, a, there's more of us than you. We want our tunes." So the, <laughs> the, the real issue is, why should it be us? That the guardians of tradition giving in to these people. <clears throat> why can't it be? What? Why? Or somehow? Or this is what I'm coming to. Somehow we have to get away and say we have to have some maintained tradition. Asha said at the very, very beginning, Nusach is learnt by hearing, hearing it, and so therefore it's essential to maintain a to maintain a tradition. Have I got time? I've got something yes. else here. Yes, go okay, on. I've got, there was an obituary of somebody in the newspaper the other day. His name was Chad Babayan. What's special about Chad Babayan? Mr. Babayan became a face of a cultural movement to, perverse, to preserve his old ways, which are in danger of being forgotten. And now there's a massive support in here. What was these old ways? He, he was from Hawaii and he maintained the tradition of how you can navigate in a boat with no compass and no nothing and no map thousands of miles across the Pacific and know exactly where you are and get there. He had these ancient, ancient, ancient knowledge 
that had been passed down through all the people living in the, in the South Pacific. He preserved this cultural knowledge, which is the most incredible knowledge, how you can survive in the South Pacific thousands of miles and find your way. And only a handful of people knew it. Imagine if, if someone had come along to them and say, we don't need your old knowledge. We got compasses and maps and Google we, and an airplane. We don't. Now, this, that's, this is what I want you to get into your head. We have a thousand year old or two, at least thousand year old tradition, which is tremendously meaningful. And it would be a complete cultural disaster on a cultural UNESCO level if we <laughs> will let it, if we let people take it away from us. We've got to do something about it. We have to fuse the two. Charles very well said. But we have to fuse the two, Melody and Nusach. Um, Jeffrey, Benji, Asher, would you like to add anything? Uh, to use your... Uh use your common sense on one hand the young people want something new by all means give them something new that fits into the frame right new but fitting in yeah. jeffrey yeah i agree with that 100 percent i'm all in favor of uh, new melodies in shul and um, fact i get very bored when you hear the same thing week in and week out and week in but you okay. know you know what it's like if, if you introduce a new melody then the congregation gets very upset. We've never heard that before. We don't really want to hear that. If you sing it, the next time you sing it and say, well, say it sounds vaguely familiar, but I'm not sure if I like it. And the third time you sing it, they tell everybody, oh, well, we've been singing this in our shawl for years. This is our tradition, <laughs> our congregation. So very I'm, very much, I'm very much in favour of new compositions. I, I wouldn't, have, wouldn't have bothered to try and compose melodies if I didn't want want to have new melodies in shul. I'm very, very much in favour of congregations singing together as well. But I believe that they have to sing together melodies that are appropriate for the occasion and that the modes that are used to reflect and to create the atmosphere for the day that we have used for centuries, we have to be passionate to maintain. Okay, thank well, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. I don't think we actually have any questions in the chat. Lots, lots of chat, but no actual questions. So, I, so I'm going to wrap up at this point. Uh, I think we've almost reached consensus, actually. I was going to sum up things and um, the consensus of, of opinion from listening to this fantastic session is that we have to have Nusach. But the problem is we don't teach it anymore. And because we don't teach it anymore, the next generation that is coming through doesn't know it. It's the same as you start with ABC, then it builds into words, then it builds into sentences, then it builds into paragraphs, and then you tell a story. It's exactly the same as learning Nusach. It's, it's not rocket science to teach it. So we have to have around the world, places where, <laughs> and schooling where we can teach it in a user-friendly manner to make it exciting. And we can, you know, to say that once you have the basis of this, you can build and express yourself and go whichever way you want. But unless that person knows about it, there's nothing that you can do about it. So we have to have these places within the schools like we used to have. You know, you learn a tune, um, a kindergarten tune, and that's built up. And everyone said the little the, the wheels on the on the bus go round, 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 and everybody's starting to sing that. But until you're taught it, you don't know about it. So if you start young enough and make it into a game and make it enjoyable and let the child express themselves, wants to know the basics. It's like knowing the, the, the letters in the alphabet. Once you know those, then you could, the world's your oyster. It's exactly the same with Nusach and exactly the same with understanding <laughs> prayer, in my opinion. And I would love to advocate that every country, every city should have some place within schools to teach our children the basics. You know, Benji quietly, quite rightly says, what's a minion? I mean, that to me, that's shocking, but <laughs> deal with it. And... When we say, well, 
we don't expect anything better. Why don't we expect anything better? Are our standards so low that we just want to let it disappear? Or are we gutsy enough to say to the chief rabbi, to the United Synagogue and the bodies that be around the world, if we don't do something now, we are lost forever. And this is, I think, we should take away from this session and we should work on it and we have to strike while the iron is still hot because we all want it. It's shown in this session we need it. So let's teach it. OK, thanks. And I'd like to thank you. Thank you for that, Alex. Thank you. Thank, thank you. OK, well, um, we are not going to leave the subject of Nusach because next next week, yes, next week, not next two weeks' time, we've added in another session on Nusach because we wanted to bring in some of the people from North America uh, who couldn't be here today because they're in a convention. Uh, and so we've, we've got another session on Nusa, which Charles, you're going to join as well. But um, we've got three other um, very good panelists. So come to that one as well. We're going to have Cantor Jacob Bensi and Mendelssohn, Jackie Mendelssohn, um, Cantor Hinder Leibovitz, who is a Cantor, um, a school director of Or HaKodesh and, and Cantor there, in Maryland, and Gideon Selemeyer from Montreal. So we, I think we'll have another very interesting discussion and an opportunity to take this, this further in, in a week's time. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Look forward to seeing many of you next week.